At what point were you selling carpets? Did you have any thoughts on jobs? Milkman's mate. Um, really? Yeah, did that for, for, for a number of years. Um, yeah, getting up at stupid o'clock in the morning, you know, going out, dropping the milk off at you know, people's doorsteps, yeah. you know, going to school, getting from school, then back out with the milkman of an evening to help, you know, go around and do the, uh, the money collections and things and never regret anything that I've done uh, because everything that you do builds on that experience. Okay, but you can't get from here to here in one jump. You don't go from first class, you know, in, you know, in a kickboxing club, to then get your black belt two days later. So why are you not good at that? I'm oh, good at everything. <laughs> um, university now is 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 hellishly expensive, and you can get the same experience, the same qualification, you know, the same you know background, but actually be in job and get paid for it. It's a bit different, ready? yeah. Something different for us. It's, yeah. it's like, so we can bring a whole lot more to the party than just our mechanical Ooh. guides and slides. Okay. All right. Well, do you want to introduce yourself then? Tell everyone about RKO. So yeah. So hello, my name's Callum Miller. Uh, I'm the UK uh, OEM sales manager. Um, my role here is to effectively grow the business and help the uh, technical su support team to meet with customers, uh, meet with clients and go through their projects, understand what it is they're looking to achieve, understand what their pain points are, and then um, and then obviously offer multiple solutions. So we're not a, this is your solution, you must use this. It's more of a case of, here's a selection of things. We think this is best because of this, this is best because of this, this is best because of this. Yep. And the customer then makes that choice. Okay. You know, we just offer them you know, what we think is going to be the best solution for them. So who are RKO? Uh, we are a Japanese manufacturer of linear guides and slides, uh, mm -hmm. needle roller bearings, cross roller bearings, and cam followers. Um, so been going since the 50s. Um, you know, we're one of the largest in the needle side of things and one of the leaders in you know, globally for linear technology. Um, okay. So well, that's the formalities out of the way. Yeah, yeah. So um, we have the same conversation with all the guests. Um, and it's more about you than than where you work. So yep. we're going to go right back to the start. Where did you grow up? Where did you live? What did you want to be when when uh, when you left school? Okay, so uh, yeah, um, born um, actually in, in Peterborough. Um, lived over there for a, a number of years, uh, but my dad's job moved us uh, into a little town called Daventry, um, and um, e effectively. You know, grew up there, standard comprehensive type education, doing all the usual stuff. Um, and as a young boy, I wanted to be a fighter pilot, as we all do. That's okay. what I wanted to be. As I got older a little bit, wanted to do helicopters because I thought, well, actually, you know, probably never going to. So I tried to tame it down a little bit. I'd like to do helicopters, yep. did some of the fitness stuff. And then my eyes went, and then that's it. You can't be a, you can't get in. That's course, it. You got to have 20 yeah. 20 vision. You can't get in. So that had to go out the window. So, Basically, after that, I decided what what else would I like to do? What would I what would I like to get into? And I've always been a bit of a geeky nerd when it comes to mechanical stuff, you know. So I played with Meccano and all that sort of stuff when I was a kid, and decided that yeah, I want to engineering. What can I get into? So I did a um, I, I did my first apprenticeship in a tube bending company. Yep. Um, so left school, went straight into that, didn't go to college, went straight into the, what was called <clears> the VIP schemes at the time. It came after YTS. Okay. Um, we were VIPs. We had these little green cards and things. And it was the initiative from the government at, yep. at the time. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I did I did that, learned, um, you know, did a BTEC, you know, there. Um, and, but I was always getting dirty and messy and, you know, you're always getting covered in cutting fluids and, grinding dust and all those sorts of stuff and cuts and bruises everywhere. And you used to see the sales guy coming in and out in his flash car and you're sort of thinking, oh, I can do his job. I'll do, I'll do what he does. Um, so I had an accident on a motorbike um, and bust my wrist. So decided at that point um, I couldn't couldn't operate the machines and things. I'd try my hand yep. um, in moving across into the the sales team side of things. Right. So moved from that, went to uh, a company called City Electrical Factors, um, went to work for them. Friend of mine from school, he's still there now actually, um, chap called Mark Raspberry. Um, 
he was, um, you know, he helped me get the job in at City Electrical, and that's what started my sales career. Yeah. If you like, okay, you know, started you know from there and and moved on. So, so the time in da- did you stay in Daventry? Still living there still now. Le- still okay, living right. there now. Yeah. Okay. So still living there now. I've got four kids, and um, yeah. Yeah, it's um, you know, been there, been there my whole life. I can't, I can't see us moving. Maybe we retire. I've got, got. I'd like to retire to the coast. Um, eventually, coast. probably down Cornwall way. Yeah, I love that's, that. That's yeah. where I'd like to go. Um, whether the wife will want to go there, <laughs> eventually is, um, you know, that's a different story. But yeah, you know, a good, good, a good few <laughs> years away from that yet. You know, still another twenty yeah, years. Still yet. to work so, a bit harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, did you have a favourite memory from your childhood? Oh, favourite memories from childhood. Um, I suppose I'd say one memory that that always sticks with me is actually one Christmas. Um, you know, really didn't know what I was getting that year. You know, you know, as a little kid, and you saw I was about, about eleven or so. Don't remember, you know, exactly the age, but trying to work out what mum and dad had got me. You're thinking, you know, I'd have no idea. I don't know what they've got me. And, uh, you know, you're opening your presents and oh, I didn't really ask for that. Uh, yeah, okay, it's great. It's fantastic. And then I was asked to go and let the dog in. Mm. So I went to open the back door and there was a a, um, a rally burner BMX, blue and yellow one. You know, it was like, you know, they were like the in thing at the time <laughs> when we were kids. And it's like, it's one memory that really, really wow. sort of like still sticks with me that that's what, that's what they'd got, you know. But, you know, they just sort of left it out the back door. Christmas morning, it was like open the back door and there it is, sort of like, you know, and that was it. Forget everything else yeah, now. That's course, it. Yeah, I'm out yeah. on that for the rest of the day. So yeah. yeah, so that that really, yeah, that really sort of sticks with me, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. Why why do you think that one sticks with you most? Out of all of the Christmases you've had. I don't know. I don't, the surprise, I think. Okay. I think it was the surprise. My mum and my you know, I come from you know working class, you know, background. Mm-hmm. My parents never really had much, you know, much money. I'm the youngest of five of us. Um so it was, you know, there was always not a lot of cash kicking around in our house as kids. And I knew that they were expensive. And I'd, I'd mentioned that I wanted one. But I didn't think I'd actually get one because they were like, yeah. you know, there were a lot of money back then. Um, you know, so it was, um, yeah, I think that that really sort of six of my, my parents had actually managed to go out and, and get me the one thing that I really, really wanted, yeah. you know, out of everything else. So, yeah, that, that yeah. really sticks. And I suppose that, that helped as well with the work ethic. And so if you work hard, you can get the stuff that you want, you know, but you yeah. haven't got to work hard for it. You can't. Yeah, exactly. You know, things that don't fall in your plate after. No, time. of course not. It's something we talk about quite a lot on this podcast, actually. Um, next question is: so eleven to you get the apprenticeship at sixteen. Sixteen. Yeah. Did school. you have any part-time yeah. jobs other than straight into the apprenticeship? Uh, Milkman's mate. Um, oh, really? Yeah, did that for 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 a number of years. Um, yeah, getting up at stupid o'clock in the morning. You know, going out, dropping the milk off at you know people's doorsteps. Yeah. You know, going to school, getting from school, then back out with the milkman of an evening to help you know go around and do the uh, the money collections and things. And yeah, did that probably from fourteen to to sixteen. So oh, so you yeah. stuck at it then? Yeah, yeah, did yeah. 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 I always had this, you know. I wanted my own money. I didn't yeah. want to rely on my parents to to pay for everything. I didn't want to rely on anybody else but me. You yeah. know, you know. So yeah, that was that was something that I've I've always done. I mean, I, I got a paper round as early as I could. I think you know, again mm. on that BMX, you know, you know, eleven years old, you know, gone and got myself a paper round, and you know, so I could buy myself stuff for the weekends, and I could go out and get myself something. I didn't have to rely on you know anybody else. You know, getting me a you know a new magazine or a, you know, yeah you know, relying on pocket money from from mum and dad so which I knew they really couldn't afford so it was like you know, get my own stuff so and at what point were you selling carpets so yeah that that came about um, I had left the engineering side of things um, that was um, yeah an unfortunate um, time I, I sort of like ended up having to leave the um, uh, the engineering company I was working for, and and I was had my I think it was my first child I think it was just about then and um, I needed I needed extra money mm-hmm. and it was like look, I really need to change and I didn't really want to leave engineering but there wasn't enough money in it so I had to I had to move and I'd done some of the sales stuff so I sort of thought well I'm going to go off and do um, you know, really sort of move into into that um 
and carpets was an interesting <laughs> an interesting thing to do it yeah, was a uh, yeah you would you would go supply all the shops so you like your anglia home furnishings yeah. and all your local carpet shops of where you would go and buy your carpet from yeah i would have been selling okay. them their rolls or yeah. their cuts of carpet so you were working in dfs or something no no no, carpet no yeah so there. working for one of the one of the big manufacturers so i worked for cosset and wilton royal right. uh, for carpets international so okay yeah so what did you learn in that time selling carpets i learned a lot about communication yeah in holding people's attention um and 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 speaking a lot more freely speaking a lot more you know uh, accurately with people instead of just spouting about we've got this new range we've got this new range or we've got you know we've got this color we've got that color listening to what the customer actually wanted what was mm -hmm. there you because you'd be surprised even in carpets you go to different areas of your territory and a different style would be better in a particular area than somewhere else okay so it was understanding really understanding what customers are after instead of just pushing them what the company wants you to sell yeah what do they want what's working for them in their blues are working over here at the mm. moment but creams are working over there or you know patterned carpets are better in this area but plain carpets are better in this area and understanding that that's what happened in the territory um, you know so that was really sort of part of that sales skill of yeah understanding what your customer yeah. actually wants <clears throat> yeah. you know not what you want to sell yeah, it's not necessarily yeah. about the product you're selling it's about no. the relationship and the communication yeah. Right. yeah yeah and that was that was very much what we learned at, at carpets international okay yeah. had some fun times there yeah, yeah. yeah enjoyed it yeah and then there was home security alarms. yeah yeah so Is that straight after no so i went no. so there's a there was a gap there so i went to um i went to telecoms um uh, company in between that okay so um i yeah, i'd left the, went to work for a small um local company um that did business phone systems so we went in and uh, and i was sort of employed as the I did the marketing and uh, new business development side of things. So I would set up the appointments or maybe go and do an appointment, find out what the customer was after, um, and then specify a system. And then the engineers would come in after me and actually then shout at me because I told them we could do stuff and we couldn't actually do it. And then yeah. they had to make it work. Sure, that happens um, in every business. All the still. time. Yeah. Um, you know, the customer would say, can you do this? Yes. I have no idea how we're going to do it, but <laughs> yes, we can do it. And you would do that sort of side of things. But okay. yeah, it was, that was that was an interesting that was an interesting time. Yeah, um, the home security came came after that again. I think I was having another child at, at that point. Again, I was chasing money and I needed to to earn something different. I'd become a little bit bored with the the uh, the, the the telecoms mm -hmm. side of things because it was very samey, very the same thing every day, day yeah. in day out, doing the same thing and um i like to do lots of different things so i went across to the home security thing and, was that uh, knocking doors yeah how yeah. was that a lot more difficult than i envisaged it yeah i can be. do that um, yeah it, that really helps you develop a thick skin mm. um, knocking on people's door six o'clock in the evening you know, they've just got home from work. They've had a hard day themselves and you're knocking on their door to try and say, hello, my name's Callum. Why would you like to buy a house alarm? <laughs> yeah. You get told to go away politely in yeah. lots of different ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was a very much a, a learning curve on how to handle objections yeah. and how to deal with people that are not necessarily in a mood to actually speak to you. But on the plus side, when you went to go and see somebody, if they bought, if they if they offered you a cup of tea, that was the buying signal that yeah, yeah. you knew you had got a sale at that point. Yeah. You know, if somebody was buying you a cup of tea, so don't ever get somebody if coming to your house. Don't give them a cup of tea because they immediately think that's it. I'm I'm in here. I've got my sale. Um, so yeah, that was. Uh, well, I was going to say what's the transferable skill, but of course that thick skin still definitely important now 100 100 yeah. percent. the the thick skin learned from that it has gone with me through yeah certainly developed a lot more self-confidence during that period of time you know before then i would have classed said i was not as confident as i am yeah. as an adult now um you know up until that job i would have been second guessing myself you know uh, looking for reassurance from other people and 
But that whole period of doing the door knocking side of things, if it taught me anything, it was to rely, you know, really to rely on my own judgment, you yeah. know, and, you know, understand my own worth within, you know, within a business. Um, so that, you know, yeah, that's the, that's the skill set that really yeah. came from there. You know, there was one training course we did there um, and it sounds really, really corny, but the, the one bit of, um, uh, of, of all of the things we went through was, Every no is one step closer to a yes. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how many no's you get, take the positive. You yeah. know, it's a no, brilliant. That's actually a really good point because now I'm 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 that, I'm that little bit closer to yeah, somebody going, game. yes. Yeah, yes, course, I do yeah. want to speak to you. Yes, I do want to buy a product. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was that out of everything that that taught me, that's probably the you know, the key yeah. thing. And I still live by that now and I say okay. it to lots of people. So, you know. Well, I noticed on your LinkedIn that you list cold calling as a skill on every job that you've had really and it's cold cold calling is something i hate oh, it's, it's not nice a yeah. lot of people hate so yeah. how do you how do you get yourself up for it you know how do you look at a list of numbers and think right i'm going to call them and i've got my pitch and i'm confident and i'm going to make a sale because i just wouldn't even ring you basically you it's it, everyone has that fear everyone has that it's not the nicest job in the world. Cold calling is not easy. It is not nice. And, you know, it, 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 everyone has that fear. Everyone has that, those butterflies of, God, I can't pick up the phone. I've got to start cold calling now. Um, but what you do is set yourself, set yourself targets of how many you're going to do. You know, when companies give people and say your job for the day is just cold calling, that's your job permanently, that's soul destroying. Yeah. You know, that is really, really bad. And companies, to be fair, this day and age, companies shouldn't be doing it. You know, have a cold call in target by all means. Have a cold call in, you know, schedule for, you know, what you want to achieve. But that if you're making somebody do that day in, day out, every day, turnover of staff is just going to be really high because people yeah. are just going to, they're just going to walk. Yeah, um, so for me, I'll look at, you know, what have I got to achieve? How much work have I got on, have I got on at the moment? Where are my gaps? What do I need to do? So I'll already have done a bit of research about the types of businesses that I want to be phoning, the types of people that I want to be speaking to, maybe been on LinkedIn, had a bit of a look about, you know, who are their, you know, what are their job roles? What have they, you know, what have they got on there? Is there anything on there I can learn about what their interests are? And then I'll then start contacting those people. Okay. So at least I've got a bit of background about them. You know, try and talk to them about something they're interested. If you sit on LinkedIn, they're interested in motorsport, maybe drop it into the you know conversation. Don't have a script. Don't yeah. have a script. You know, scripts are the worst thing in the world. Because you know, anyone that's that that is in any position where they can make a decision, they can actually buy something. They will know you are reading from a script. Yeah, of course. The moment yeah. you start talking to them, yeah, you know, it's the worst thing companies can do. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, it's good. Uh, it's good feedback for a lot of the viewers. I mean, especially the younger people. It's just not something that you know people don't pick up the phone anymore anyway so yeah we used to have to stand up when i was doing the home security we used to have a day where we had to stand we had to go we had to come to milton Keynes actually and we had to do cold calling and part of it was if you uh you know if as soon as somebody answered you had to stand up and say so all of your colleagues could see that you were on the phone to somebody oh god and then you had the bell at the end of the room that if you got an appointment from that cold call, you had to walk to the end of the room, ring the bell, <laughs> and then go back and sit down. And the management seemed to think that that was like encouraging us. It was yeah. like, oh my God, this is like, it's yeah. cringeworthy. Yes. It's it's not the best. Yeah. Is there any point in your career where you've thought, this is a step up now, or, you know, this is a, a big move for me, um, either internally or... Or even after some success, I suppose. There's been a couple of points in my career where that's happened. Um, some of them have worked, some of them not so well. Mm. Um, I'd say the first one and the the one that's got me into the industry I'm in now was when I got the job at, at Corio, JTEC. Yes. Um, when I went there, um, I, I hounded them for the job. Uh, and my ex-MD there... Um, He'll, he'll tell you the story mm. if you ever speak to him. Um, had my interviews. I'd gone through the whole interview process. And they said, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll give you a call. You know, we haven't made a decision yet. So, okay, well, when are you going to make the decision by? going to be you know, be Friday. So on Friday, I'll be like, 
Hello. Yeah, you made your decision yet? <laughs> no, no, we haven't, we haven't got a decision from Japan yet. Was, and I think basically they gave me the job just to shut me up, <laughs> just just to stop me from phoning them. Um, so, I, I, and that I, that was a job I really wanted because I knew that would that would get me back into a technical type sale, a technical yeah. type role. So it would appeal to a number of different factors for myself and it parts my own psyche is that doing the sale because you get that buzz from doing the sale but also doing the the engineering side of things so being able to look at different applications and things and they're the two things that sort of appeal to me personally okay and that was a that that i enjoyed that i did enjoy that um and then i left there to go to another japanese manufacturer um which in hindsight was probably not the best move for myself, it was a big step up um, for myself. I'd moved from just being one of the, um, uh, yeah, one of the engine, you know, the technical sales engineers, um, and then I was heading up the aftermarket team, um, you know, for the UK. Um, timing wasn't great. Um, COVID hit, um, caused a, a bunch of issues and things. So there was a, it was an awkward. It was an awkward time. Um, it was a it was a jump I wanted to do. It was something I, I definitely and I don't regret doing it. I mm. never regret anything that I've yeah. done uh, because everything that you do <clears throat> builds on that experience. It builds on your own personal yeah, you know, you know growth. But do I look back on it and think it was it the wrong decision? Yeah, I do. I think it was the wrong decision at the time. I should have I should have waited. I should have held out and, and looked for something else. But it has helped me and it got me this position here in the end. Yep. So yeah, there are. Was there a gap in between, or was it? Yeah, so I, I when I when I left, I ended up working for um, for Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Um, so not on my LinkedIn profile. Nobody will find no, that. Of course. Um, so yeah, I worked there for about four months. Yeah. Um, needed to make my redundancy money. You know, last for a, you know for a little bit of period of time while I was looking for something you know more in my sphere, um, and I was printing t-shirts. Oh, was yeah. So literally running the machine, um, picking out people's designs, and people can put some horrendous things on T-shirts. Um, yeah. But you're not to have an opinion on it. You're just a print. Whatever comes in front of you, that's what you have to put on. But it was running the machine, you know, checking it, quality inspections, putting it through, and then it would go through the system. Um, mm. So, yeah, that was... Do you find that mm, sort of just repetitive... It was repetitive, Boring. but it was cathartic as well because okay. I'd come from high, you know, high pressure sort of, you know, technical sales yep. world to go in to do this. You just stood in front of a machine, you know, yeah. printing off t-shirts <sighs> for twelve hours, you know, night shift as well. Um, you just yeah, <clears throat> pick the design out, press the buttons, put it in the machine, let it do what it's doing. It was, yeah, it was boring. But it was relaxing as well at the same time. Okay. So, you know, it was an it was an interesting job. Mm. Um, me personally, I ended up just because of the top person I am. The engineers would be coming across looking at some of the machines because they weren't working, and then I'd end up spending more time with them helping getting the machine running <laughs> again than actually doing what my my day job yeah. was. Um, but uh, yeah, did that did that for about four months. Okay. Um, you mentioned redundancy and SK. Yes. Yeah. Um, we don't have to go into the actual. I want to know how it felt from your side. How did you deal with that? Sort of what did it feel like? Yeah, horrible. Yeah. Um, horrible. Second time I've been through redundancy. Oh, really? um, you know, and um, yeah, it was um, just got a phone call and said, could I come up to the office? Um, you know, you know, you're asking your boss, you know, do I need to prepare a presentation? Do I need to do anything? No, no, no. Just bring yourself and you know, make sure you bring all your stuff with you. You're thinking. Yeah, hold on a minute. That don't that don't sound so the gut, you know, that that horrible Yeah, you know, that gut Still feeling turning. something's happening, this ain't gonna be good. You know, and then you get there and you walk in, HR lady's there, you know, your boss is there, and you're thinking, yeah, well, this is only going one way today, isn't it? It's not it ain't going any other way. This is yeah. I know what's coming. Um so yeah, it was it was it wasn't a nice experience. Um but again these experiences they help you as a as a character you can't let something like that define you you can't let it you can't be bitter about these things 
You know, no. Business is business at the end of the day. Companies have got to make a living. They've, they've got to run and they've got to be profitable. Yeah. Um, and if you happen to be a casualty, unfortunately, that's what happens. Um, you know, but, you know, I, you know, let's say I moved on, um, you know, and if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have found the job here. Um, you know, and I'm really happy in, in, in what I do here and, you know, being here, if I, if, if I, and I've said to the guys before, this is very much like working with my ex colleagues at Coyo. They're very, very similar companies okay. set up in a similar way. Um, attitudes, very similar. Um, the company dynamic is, is, is very similar to what it was when I was, when I was there. So given the freedom to do what I want to do, your opinion is valid. Your opinion is, is taken on board. And that's not just myself. That goes down to any of the customer services team or the, even the warehouse staff. If they come in and say, actually, if we do this process in this particular way, it will make things better. Everything is taken on board and everything is, you know, is looked at. And that I really like, you know, and that's, that's what's you know, led me to stay, you know, here, uh, you know, not, not move on again. So. There's something in in all of your answers so far. Actually, there's this determination. There's there's a very solid mentality that I'm sure viewers will learn from. But there's always a question that I have, and it's around how do you deal with challenges? Obviously, you're very you know positive, and it's every negative leads to a positive. That's great. Yeah. How do how can how can people deal with challenges like a redundancy and to pick themselves back up and get back on the horse. Breaking and, everything down, breaking yeah. everything down into the manageable chunks. You know, like anything in life, if you, you've got a goal that you want to achieve. You know, it's a, and anyone that's done any sort of sales courses will go through the same thing. You've got a target you've got to get to here. Okay, but you can't get from here to here yeah. in one jump. You know, so break that down. What do I need to do to make that, to get a bit closer, to get a bit closer? And that's how you have to look at everything. Look at that in life. Look at that in your friendships. Look at that in, you know, in business. If you do everything in those those smaller chunks, how do I get to where I want to be? You know, and have that and be determined to get there. You know, be determined that that is my goal. That is where I want to get to, you know. But then when you get there, well, I need a new target. Now I've got to yeah. move on. Now I've got to set myself something new. And to be fair, what happens is if you start from here to here, by the time you get to here, this target here has now gone, actually, I need to yeah. I need to move it up because I'm almost at my target. So yeah. now I need a new target. So that's what you sort of, you, you're doing with time. You know, I did it with, you know, learning my black belt. You know, uh, you know, I, you know you, again, it's, it's steps. You don't go from first class you know, in, you know, in a kickboxing club to then get your black belt two days later. You have to learn. You have to, it's all about that, that development, you know, and that's, I suppose in a crux, that's how I treat everything is, mm. is how do I make that next step? How do I make that next move? And is it going to be good for me? And is it, you know, you know and be critical about yourself, you know, be honest about can you do what it is you're looking to do? And if you can't, then adjust what your actual expectations are. Don't try to achieve the unachievable. So yeah. what are you not good at then? I'm good at everything. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, yeah, for me, it's it, it's the, the roles where I get to speak to people, interact with people. That's, for me, I, I personally feel I'm, I'm, I'm good at that. I'm good at you know, talking to people, making relationships, you know, and helping people. You know, I like to look at applications and things. I like to look, you know, I'm nerdy. I like, I like to look at an application and go, oh, what's it do? You know, even if it's not got my product in it, I've just got off the subject now because I want the, you know, I want to know what yeah. somebody else is doing. Um, so yeah, that's I, I suppose that's that's what I'm good at is is communication. You know, that's that's my my key thing. Yeah. You know. Um, my wife will tell you I'm grumpy. I tell her I'm not, but you know. So I'm grumpy when I get home because I've been smiling all day at work. Oh, That's I what say it that is. to my wife, actually. Yeah. But why do you never talk when you're at home? Because I talk all I talk day. all day, yeah. Yeah, it's oh, my job. Just give me a breather. Yeah. I want to just relax now, <laughs> put the telly on, you know, and enjoy my own, my own time at home. But, yeah. You know. Okay. So um, I think we've spoken enough about career hmm. and there's some good bits there for people to pick out. What I want to talk about next is the future of manufacturing. 
the next mm-hmm. generation of industry. So a scenario I'll give to everyone. So imagine you're stood in front of a classroom yep. of the next generation of engineers. What advice would you give them? Oh, personally, I would say they need to, don't necessarily need to go down the university route. Okay, modern apprenticeships are are working really, really well. Okay, we're even considering um, putting somebody in in here. Okay. Um, you know, but it would be an overall sort of route. So myself and the, the general manager, we've discussed you know, a couple of times. You know, would it work with a business like us? We're not sure, but we personally think it's it's definitely a route. Um, you know, university now is 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 hellishly expensive. Yeah, and you can get. The same experience, the same qualification, you know, the same you know background, but actually be a job and get paid for it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something I would I, I would say to a lot of people these days. There are certain careers that yeah, university is a must. You know, you have to go down that route. But there are especially with the engineering, you don't necessarily need to be doing that route. You know, you know, my own son, he he actually tried both. So he's he went to uni. Um, he did you know, a year. And then just went, you know what, actually, this isn't for me. Got himself into a, into a modern apprenticeship with a big company over in rugby. And, um, and he's doing great for himself. You know, he's, he's, bought, his, he's bought his first house. He's, you know, he's getting married yeah. next year. I mean, he's only 20, you know, get, tell me off now, probably got his age wrong. I think he's 26, <laughs> I think. If you're watching this, sorry. Um, you know, I think he, yeah, I think he's 26. Uh, yeah, saying he's, you know, he's just bought, he's bought his first house, you yeah. know, and, um, you know, life's going really well for him. And, mm. you know, he's, he's done all that just through his apprenticeship. And yeah. he's, he's got his degree that he was after. He's got all of that, you know, that education, but he's been paid for it the entire way through. Yeah, you know, I went down that route. And looking back, the grads that would come in, they'd never seen product before. Um, they'd never spoken to customers before. Yeah. They were like rabbit in the headlights, you know. Um, some of the bigger companies would do schemes where they'd put them all on the road and give them a car. And, you know, suddenly they've got all of these responsibility and a huge pressure on them. Yeah. But they'd only last a year or so. Yeah. Because a lot of experience have not been gradually put into it. When you're an apprenticeship, you do start from the bottom and you have yeah. to work your way through. Yeah. But you are gradually exposed to every part of the business. Mm-hmm. You are gradually put in situations where that help you learn, develop, and, um, yeah. and, and, and find your own way to, to deal with things, you know. And I, I think that's a real, it's a real plus at the moment. I think that, you know, we've got it right at the moment with the apprenticeships. You know, there was a period of time when, when I was a kid, when we did apprenticeships, they were worthless. You know, when we did them, they weren't great. And I think that that's part of where some of that reluctance to do from parents when they're talking to their kids, they think about the old YTS schemes. Yeah. And they were terrible. They weren't great. They didn't work. Companies used them to just get cheap labor and you mm-hmm. didn't really get a decent education out of it. It's not like that now. You know, companies do invest and they do put money into people and it is a real qualification you get at the end of it that, yeah. that is helped and designed by other people in business. Yeah. You know, and I think that is that is key to it. So, you know, I'd, I'd say, look, you know, if you're not the type academic, you don't want to sit there and... and you know, have your head stuck in a book, doing research. And if you're not that way inclined and you are just, but you are good with your hands, you do yeah. fix your own bike, you do help dad with the car, you do, you know, you know, the, you know, something goes wrong in the house, you're the one that wants to try and fix it. Consider the, the apprenticeship yeah. route because that would be, you know, potentially good for you. Yeah, not even not even to that extreme. I was never like that. My right. dad, my whole family are mechanical engineers. Yeah. Me and my brother, there's always a joke in our family that we know nothing about DIY or anything about cars. His dad was so good at it all. He did it, yeah. but didn't have the patience to teach us how to do it. Um, but I couldn't go to university. Like Once I'd finished school, I was sick of education. Yeah. Um, I sort of knew that I wanted to be an engineer, but it was just the curiosity of learning things or or knowing how things work. I'd never actually, you know, you know all the stories that I used to take things apart and but never did that. Yeah. Weren't interested. Probably on PlayStation or something, or, <laughs> or out with my mates playing football. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't have to be the extremes. I think you. I think you. You're right. I think unless you're going to go into a specific field or you want to be a researcher, then um, apprenticeship is is definitely the best route at the minute. Yeah. 
We just need more of them. Yeah, we need to get more people into yeah. them. Yeah, I think I think it's, it is a good thing. I think you know, the, you know, you know, governments can do more to help you know push that agenda. That they can help to for businesses, especially to take people on and and, and do that as well. Because the costs involved, you know, to businesses is, yeah. is not it's not cheap for the business to do it. Um, it's so, the time as well. It's not just the money. Yeah, the yeah. time that you invest. So and that's and that's where the difference, especially you know, for a couple like ours, we're 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 just a small medium. Although we're part of a big global company, mm. we here in the UK we are a small to medium yeah. sized business. Um, so for us to invest that sort of time and you know a, a, an effort into somebody, we need to make sure that person's gonna a once they finish that apprenticeship is gonna remain with the business at least for another four or five years. Yeah, you know. You know, because then we get that return on that investment that we've mm. put in them, um, and it's it's difficult. It is a difficult decision to make. Um, you know, and I can understand ways you know how it works. You know, but with with some of the bigger companies, it's definitely you know they they've got that more time. They need these new people coming in because they've got the people leaving at the other end. Yes. So they've got you know the the new apprentices are filling in those gaps. Yep. Businesses like ours, it doesn't work like that. You know, we're going to take one apprentice on, and that might be it for the next five years. Yeah. We're going to take another one on then. You know, not like a big engineering company. We'll have every year. This year we'll take yeah, five. This take. year we'll take yeah. six. Next year we're going to take ten. This year we'll take two. You know, we're not in that position, and I think that's where the gap is at the moment. Is the smaller companies need a bit more, a bit more help. Yeah. To be able to do that, you know. But are there any skills that you you would say that? You know, imagine you're still in front of this classroom. Yep. Crucial skills that they need to develop, not just technical, um, that would help them in their career. Eye contact. You know, making sure, you know, don't Glad you said don't, that, don't look yeah. away from people. Yep. You know, look at them. You know, it was one of the things I was taught when I was very young. You know, some people can be put off by it. Some people can be very, um, you know, shy about doing that and I think this generation have got a little bit too much of sitting on their phone yep. and send it, speak to people you know don't just send a text message don't just send an email you know they've got you know so you've got to learn to communicate communicate with your friends communicate with other people you know verbally don't just do it with you know, an electronic communication because there's too much of that at the moment and we see it a lot yeah um, you know, I'd say those are probably the two the two things, that, and anyone can do that. You know, you, you know, it doesn't matter what age you are, it mm-hmm. doesn't matter what background you come from, what your intelligence level is. That's it's all that's all completely irrelevant. You know, you know we are as a you know, as a people, you know, uh, you know, a, a very you know, expressive, you know, animal. If you like, yeah. that's what we are, you know. Yeah. So learn to read it, learn to read facial expressions, learn to read, you know, how they're sitting, you know, you know, you just do it yourself. You, know, you don't have to go on some of these courses that tell you about open body language, closed body language, and you know, and all these sorts of things. Don't worry about that. If you're talking to somebody and actually talking to them, engaging with them, you will see that reaction in, in yeah. people. You'll just pick it up naturally. It yeah. will come naturally to everybody. Yeah. You've just got to do it. And that again. That's probably the difficult part because there's a lot of a lot of kids now back away from that. You know, my daughter will be one. She she's not great. You know, so that social anxiety that um, mm-hmm. that a lot of generation have got at the moment. You know. Yeah, a hundred percent. I talked about it in a couple of episodes. We went and did a, a college event, and um, we had all these students in front of us. You could count on one hand the amount of amount of them that made eye contact. Yeah. They were all looking at their feet or they were checking the phone in the pocket, yeah. talking to the mates, like, not interested. Yeah. You know? And it's hard to break that. But you can't shout at them and say, right, yeah. <laughs> this is this is how you sort of communicate with people. Um, I suppose once they get into the workplace, it'll be a, a bit of a, yeah, a shock. Yeah, I mean, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be a bit of a shock for some of them. I think some of them will find that, especially some of these, these that have come through the COVID years. Yes. You know, so if they were... If they were sort of 13, 14 when COVID hit, they're going to be the group I think are going to suffer the worst. Yeah. Um, because they had two years where they basically didn't interact with people. They didn't really get out. And that was a crucial time for them in that early teens. Yeah. 
developing into the people that they were going to be. And then all of a sudden they were released back out into the world, into the wild. Yeah. And it was very different for them. Um, I think they're going to have a, you know, and they're the group now that are, they're the 18 year olds mm-hmm. now, you know, and you, you, you sort of thinking, yeah, they're going to find it, they're going to find it difficult. They're going to find it a little bit hard to, to get through all of that. You know, if you were you know 13 to 16, you know, during COVID, yeah, they're the you know they're the they're the group that are really gonna you know gonna struggle. I think, um, mm. but they just gotta have confidence in themselves. I would yeah. say you know try to try to get you know put that down. It's you know they're not the only one. Yes, they're not they're not an individual that is having those feelings. They're not you know there's a whole host of you that are mm. going to be exactly the same. You know, and don't think that because we're, you know, I've got a lot of experience and that I've been out there and I'm self-confident. When I was a teenager, I wasn't as confident as no. I am now. No, you know, I didn't have the ability to hold a conversation and talk to somebody and and act as the authority on something. You know, that comes with time and experience and yep. being exposed to it. You've just got to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, you know, just keep focusing. Again, go back to that. Focusing on where you want to get to, you know, keep your eye on the prize, and eventually, if you break it down and go, you know, take a little bit at a time, you'll get there. You know, you know we all can. Yep. So, so I've got some closers for you. Yep. Do you consider yourself successful? <sighs> Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. What's missing? No. Um, I think I've got more to give. I think I've got more to do yet. Um, other people, I think, have told me that I've been a success and I've made a success of what I've done over the years. I personally still have more drive in me. More, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not finished yet. I, you know, I want to. I want. To, I'm in that part of my career now where I want to start helping somebody else come through, helping somebody else get on that ladder and, you know, learning you know, our industry, you know, mechanical engineering, you know, whether it be within, you know, bearings industry, whether it be, you know, just you know, power transmission side of things. I see myself going on now to being a mentor to somebody else, mm-hmm. you know, helping them develop their career, helping them move on. And I think, if I can do that, then I think I'll be a success. Okay. You know, when I've helped somebody else become a success, I think that, yeah. yeah um, Where does that come from? That Did you have mentors that pushed you? I had, yeah, there's been two over my life that have, that have really sort of guided what I've done and I've learned from them. And I will name them in case that either of them are watching. Um, so one of them was a chap called Paul Jackson and, and he was at Carpets International. Um, now he was fantastic. He was probably the best sales manager I ever had in my career. And I really big him up. You know, I don't know where he is now. I haven't spoken to him since I left. Really? Um, I, you know, I know he lived up in the north, uh, Northwest. That's as much as I can tell you. <laughs> um, but um, he was a real big influence on me. He, you know, I, used to, I really looked up to him as a young sales guy. You know, if I could be that to somebody else. I'd be really happy with that, you know, because he 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 had a real knack of being able to read my customers where I had teed them up to do stuff. And he understood what they wanted better than I did. And he didn't even know them. Mm-hmm. You know, and how he did it, I don't know. To this day, I still don't know. I you know, I still want to know what the magic was. Um so he was really good. And the other one would be a chap called Carl Norton. Um he's over, he's still over at Coy or at JTEC, as far as I know. Um, and he really taught me a way about managing people, um, you know, listening, you know, you know, helping other, again, more of that helping other people, you know, helping them to develop, to be, to yeah. help the team, mm-hmm. you know, so none of the, the me stuff, none of the, I did this, I did that. We did that. We did this. I know it's corny. I know it's cheesy. I know it's, you know, when you do it as a course and things like that, it is real cheese. But actually, when you experience it and somebody does it properly with you, it does influence you and it does give you a real, you know, something else to, you know, to become. You know, I'd like to be a blend of the two, if you like. You know, Carl for his ability to talk to people and his ability to 
to get the best from people without demanding anything and Paul for his ability to, you know, just to sell, mm. to be able to, you know, read a customer and understand what they wanted and, and get the most, not just for you as a business, but for the customer as well. So the customer felt happy that the deal was good for everybody. Yeah, and I think those two bits, you know, they're, they're, you know that's, that would be that would be ideal for me if okay. I can get into my career and somebody says I gave them that. Yeah, that would be really nice. Yeah, that's the reward. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you look at all the success that you've had, individual successes throughout your career, would you attribute that to hard work or luck? Hard work. Yeah. Hard Confident work. on that. Yeah. 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 Hard work. You know, yeah, you know, what's that saying that they say? You know, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Yeah. Absolute hundred percent true. Yeah, luck plays a part. It does play a part in life. You know, you have to be in the right place at the right time. But if you don't know your subject, if you don't know what you're talking about, and you're not confident about it, yeah, it doesn't matter that you're in the right place at the right time. Yeah, of course, yeah. If you say the wrong things, yeah, tough luck. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, the hard work. You know, because you've got to know, you've got to put the effort in to put yourself in those places. You know, you know, if you don't put that work in, you're not going to have the right moment, the right person. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, hard work, definitely. So if the the roles were were, were reversed, you were sitting in this seat, what yep. question would you ask? I would say, where did you get the inspiration to to do this sort of thing? To you know, what's made you want to ask people like myself mm. about our careers you know how what 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 made you choose this route hmm, i wasn't prepared for that one <laughs> uh i suppose where else do you get this story in industry you know unless you know unless someone knows you personally how would they ever find out yeah you know, what drives you um, or that you've got this strong mentality or that communication's your good skill or um, so I think that's important it's also important you know my ethos at the minute is same with the, the business is that we want to disrupt how things are yeah you know, we want to be a thorn in people's side um, this certainly does it because people aren't doing it people have got lazy yeah you know, people chuck crappy 10 second videos on LinkedIn and think that's enough. Yeah. You know, the new, new next generation of, in, of, of engineers, of people, they watch podcasts, they watch YouTube, you know, yeah. we've had, we've had guests on, uh, Ashley from Iga, she was 26. She's a marketing manager there, but she said she doesn't watch TV anymore. She only watches YouTube. Yeah. She's 26. So imagine someone 16, what do they watch? Yeah. Well, I know myself, I'm 30. I'll watch YouTube. And then I'll have TikTok on my phone or a game whilst I'm eating dinner, whilst I've got my laptop and I'm looking at emails. Like nothing's enough. Everything needs to be quicker and quicker. So this sort of format just, you know, it sort of blends the two. You get a chance to tell your story. People get to learn about you. Yeah. We get to reach a different audience than people are normally reaching. Is that good enough answer? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. No problem, my pleasure. I appreciate you being on. I appreciate you supporting Engineers Insight. You've been a customer for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think there's, there's definitely a lot that people take from this, this, uh, this episode, just about how to deal with challenges, you know, and, and what it takes to be successful. I know you said that you're not successful yet, but to be in a, in a position like you are, you know, if, when we started talking about what this podcast would be, um, yes, it's about stories, but actually it's about someone watching it and thinking, well, that's just a normal person. Yeah. You know, yes, you've got good skills and you know, say you've got some bad skills, but you're a normal person that's worked extremely hard to get to a very good position. So on that one, one viewer to think, well, I could do that. Yeah. And that's, that's why we're doing it. So I appreciate it. Thank no you problem. very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Cheers. <laughs>